Aloha friends, it's Robert Stelic. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Planet Show, which I produce right here in my home office in the garage. This is my little recording studio right here. And today's guest is none other than Mark Rappahorst. On this show, I interview wing foil athletes, designers and thought leaders, and ask them in-depth questions about wing foil equipment and technique. I'm also trying to get to know my guests a little bit better, find out about their background, how they got into the sport, and what inspires them, and how they live their best life. I realize these interviews are really long and not everybody has time to watch the long videos. I personally like the visuals, I'm a visual learner, so that's why I add the video. But if you don't want to sit there and watch video for an hour and a half, you can also listen to these shows as a podcast. Just search for The Blue Planet Show on your favorite podcast app and you can listen to it while you're driving or on the go. Today's guest is none other than Mark Rappelhorst, the founder of SIC Sandwich Isle Construction and now Flying Dutchman foil board. So some really cool insight into his background, how he grew up in Holland and moved to Maui when he was only 16 years old and then got into the business of building boards and how he loves tinkering and experimenting and 80% of his experiments fail but 20% are the ones that make all our lives a little bit better. So thank you Mark for doing all that research and experimentation that benefits all of us. He gives us some really good insights into wing foiling, downwind foiling, foils in general, board design and so on. So I really appreciate Mark sharing his time and also for sharing details about his personal life and living life to the fullest and basically following your dream and finding a balance between working hard, doing what you love, but also enjoying life and kind of having some free time and not having all the stress of running a business, which I can totally relate to, Mark. So thanks again for your time. And without further ado, here is Mark Rappahorst. Okay, Mark Rappahorst, welcome to the Blue Planet Show. How are you doing today? All good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, fantastic. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I, I talked to previously, I talked to Alan Cadiz and uh, Kane the Wild on the interviews, yep. and they both mentioned you as someone I should talk to probably. And okay. that, they, you know, they're both um, you, used your boards for wing foiling and really liked them and so on. So stoked to have you here. And I think you're probably one of the most knowledgeable guys in in the industry about when it comes to board building and design. So I'm um, really impressed by what you've done over the years, but can you talk a little bit about your background, like where you're from and how you got into water sports and how, how you ended up on Maui? Um, I grew up sailing with my dad uh, in the Netherlands and um, that soon turned into windsurfing. We're talking 1984. Um, and, um, I learned how to build custom boards in the Netherlands, in Scheveningen. Um, I want to pursue that career more so, not just by sanding and glassing, but more shaping. Um, left the Netherlands when I was a little grommet, maybe seven, I think I was 17, got here and um, ultimately was given the opportunity to learn how to shape for a company by the name of Angulo Hawaii. Um, became a production shaper for 10 plus years and um, went on my own, um, started the repair shop first called Dinkings and then um, branched out into building outrigger canoes, which is really a hollow object. It's not really a custom um, styrofoam shape um, for, built from the inside out, but more from the outside in. Um, and that morphed into uh, SUP boards, first hollow and then later on, uh, um, styrofoam cord and um, that morphed into uh, hydrofoil boards and, and wing foil boards. Wow. So you, did you say you came, went to Maui when you were 17 years old? Actually 16. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I've been here for 35 years. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, I, I guess in growing up in Holland, like, in, and yeah, like I have a similar background. I, you know, I grew up in, in Berlin and I learned to windsurf and then my dream was to go to Hawaii and I, you know, ended up on Maui for three years and then, then Oahu. But um, what, 
I don't know. Yeah, like what at 16 years old, like how what made you go to Maui? Um, um, I was just uh, super excited about the water sports and in, in those days windsurfing and um, I was kind of hitting a, a dead end road uh, at the part-time job that I had in the Netherlands I was already building boards uh, part-time when I was out of school um, and then I quit school and because I was stubborn and I already left my parents place early um, for situations that I won't go into. But anyway, I was pretty independent. Um, my two sisters that um, part raised me were also travelers. And so they encouraged me, go hit the road, explore. And um, in those days, you know, at that age, you don't have many belongings. So leaving was, was pretty easy. You know, it's not like you have the house, mortgage, car. You just have, uh, I don't know everything fit in one suitcase. So I left and um, kind of never came back. Wow. So I remember when I first came to Maui, you couldn't, I couldn't rent a car because you had to be 21 and you, I couldn't drink or couldn't do much of anything really. Um, so how did you, I mean, did you know anybody on Maui that helped you out? Or, I mean, how did you get around and like, I know, there's no buses on Maui. So how did you do that? <laughs> um, I forged, I forged uh, my driver's license. Um, I drilled out <laughs> the pictures of, uh, of some type of ID. And um, with the uh, rivets, I put in um, my own ID, uh, my own picture. So I, I took, I think, my sisters or something. And for two years, I drove around illegally, basically. But I did get pulled over once or twice. But the police force at that time without the world wide web was like what kind of driver's license is this and they would always scold me for not having an international driver's license i begged for forgiveness they let me go they couldn't be bothered and off i went but it was different times though and then you can't get away with that stuff now but i did then because you're right, right. You, you you just you have to have a car here and that's how i got around bought a an old Maui cruiser, which is pretty common too. Um, drove around <laughs> uninsured, which nobody should do anymore right now. But yeah, they were more the Wild West. You know it. Um, yeah. Th in those days. Yeah. Yeah. Back then, nobody locked their cars on Maui either. You just left the oh, car locked because nope. it was, you didn't want someone to break your window, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It's interesting that you've experienced that as well. So, you probably do not sound surprised. It's like, yeah. And even the locking, I, in the last 10 years, I started locking my, my car. Um, but that was kind of not required either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then, I mean, I remember your, the dinking shop being down by close to the airport by where Costco and so on is now. Yep. So was that your first location or? First location, yes. Yeah. Yes. And then why did you have to move from there to upcountry where you are now? Um, uh, my landlord, A&B, was making, I don't know what I paid in rent, and such a minuscule amount that I paid. And then Costco came around and they said they wanted a, a giant parking lot. So it's just dollar numbers. Um, they wanted me out. And, uh, you know, I basically was there for the last five years of that just to make sure that the squatters wouldn't move in. Um, it was an old building from the 40s. It was an old train, train station. And um, as long as I paid uh, liability insurance and, and kept the squatters out and uh, paid some rent, they were happy. But everything got more serious, including somebody willing to pay serious dollars for that nice piece of real estate. And I wasn't it, so out I went. But um, so now that your spot where you are now, you said you can walk from your house to work. Well, it's a, it's a little confusing. Uh, so I relocated to a place in Haile Miley, which is, you know, technically a uh, Makawao area. Um, and I, I built up uh, my shop in an old pineapple um, facility. And it, uh, um, I ran that over there for three years, but then I wasn't enjoying my um 
my reality of having a bunch of employees and um, running production. So I sold the shop and, and uh, I sold it to the people that bought the company SIC that I also started. And um, uh, that was great. Uh, no more employees because, you know, that is an effort to uh, uh, insurance, liability, this and that. I'm, you're probably familiar with it at times, but it, um, I was over it. And um, I haven't owned it for so most likely like six, seven years. And the shop that I'm talking about, where I walk to, is on my property in Haiku. And it is... Wow. Uh, a big steel warehouse that um, it's just me in there. And uh, occasionally I get help from somebody vacuum bagging. But okay. So basically right now your shop is on your own property. You can just walk, you know, I guess walk from your house to your, to your shop and work. And, and then when the, when the epoxy is curing, you can go back to your house and, kick back yes. and relax for a while yeah that's pretty awesome my my reality is like i wake up pretty pretty damn early in the morning i wake up around four um hang out with uh, my wife i usually read in the morning and then right around six i i walk down i uh, i do a step or two or come up at nine have breakfast either um i go surf or um I look at the wind. If the wind's up lately, I go wing foil. And then I come home uh, around three or so and um, I do one more step uh, on whatever I started in the morning because the, the resin I use usually takes about five, six hours to, uh, to cure. And um, that would be my day, like six hours of work and three, four hours of play. That sounds like a great, great way to do it. Yep. Awesome. Do you have like a certain routine in every morning that you, um, that you do? Like, I don't know. I, I always like to ask people that. Yes. Um, I do. Uh, lately I, I try to avoid uh, the news a little bit because it, it, it's hard to uh, stay positive when you read um, the same stories over and over again. So it's either a good book or um yeah, I'm a coffee fanatic, so it, it usually requires two, three cups of coffee to get me rolling. Um, I, I read all kinds of stuff. Right now, I'm into uh, the Viking sagas, and but it can be political, historical. Um, I get the Atlantic once a week, so it is, there's so much to read and so little time. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, but I get antsy around eight o'clock or so, and I need to, to start moving. Um, and um, it, it kind of depends a little bit. Winter months, I would try to get out the, the, the door maybe at seven or so to go surf. But this time of year, when the surf is, uh, is often blown out here, I'll stay home till nine or 10 and maybe wing foil. Yeah. My wife and I do this together, it's fun. It's pretty addictive. Um, at times it's frustrating because it's always something new to learn or equipment to figure out. And when I go out, it's half the time it's homework for me and half the time it's fun. It's, I'm always tinkering and, and know that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. So there'll be always some little tweak that I think about. Um, but that's just the nature of uh, a designer and shaper. Yeah, but it's nice if you can combine your passion with your job, right? I mean, that's kind of yes. how it is for me too. It's like, yeah, yeah. yes, it's fun when you can uh, do something fun for work, right? So <laughs> you yes. can't complain yes. about that. Yeah, no complaints here. So yeah. right now, your biggest um, passion is is wing foiling. That's what. Yeah, you do I'd say so. Well, my my very biggest, but I don't do it enough, is downwind SUP foiling. Um, right. But it takes half a day, and it's something that you kind of do on your own. You can even go with people, but uh, out in the big blue, I find myself, you know, alone. Once you're up on a foil, you don't really stop and look around for your buddies that you left with because it's sometimes hard to get back up. And um, like SUP or or outrigger, it's some 
it's a run that you can more easily do with people but um the the downwinding on uh on an sup uh, on foil is um i don't know it takes like four or five hours by the time you're done with the logistics and uh i'm often quite tired too it uh i'm getting better at at not um being exhausted but man i remember the early days when i learned with alan Cadiz and ken winner it was just like oh um it's it's hard work yeah getting up right, on it's, it's hard work yeah huh? and uh you know now i learned how to pick my my um my conditions but uh, at times we would pick the wrong conditions and it, it was a frustrating affair mm -hmm. yeah it can be yeah yeah, so, um, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the nice things about wing foiling is that you're, you know, you always have the power when you need it, right? So yes, you don't have to, yes. you don't have to um, muscle up onto the foil. So kind of like that for sure. Yep. Especially here on Oahu, we don't get as much wind as you do on Maui. So, yes. so is, is this your current shop here in, the, in yes, this video? That, okay. Yeah, that's, that's the property we live on, uh, yeah. building I put up. And uh, the beauty about it is like, in a way, if I don't use it for a couple of days, I don't feel guilty. Like in the old shops, I knew rent had to be paid, insurance and all that. And so there was a certain, you know, grind that I felt like I, I was obliged to keep pumping out boards. Um, now I pump out boards because the demand is, is really high. Um, but i mean it's you know rent is is minimal so uh, mm. yeah yeah i mean it's definitely nice to lower your overhead and not have so many responsibilities for sure i mean i, yes. I feel the same way we went from being open seven days a week to five days a week and i don't think i ever want to go back to seven days a week it's just like yes yeah i don't know it's, it seems it seems kind of crazy to to do that if you don't have to yes but um Let's go back to you um, growing up in the Netherlands. Yes. Do you have like an early childhood memory, like some, like a time you remember where this, like, I love this, like being in the water or, or, you know, I guess sailing or windsurfing or where you, you knew that this is your passion. This is what you want to do for the rest of your life. Yeah. The, the windsurfing thing is, it, it was almost a national sport in the Netherlands, probably the same in Germany. Um, yeah. In the heydays, uh, one out of four families had a windsurf board. So um, the Hawaiian guys that would come for the World Cup were like gods to little grums like me. The, the Cabrina, Nash, uh, Aguera guys were like, wow, here they are, legends. And um, so I was always curious. I'm like, wow, what's, uh, what is it like in Hawaii? And I, I particularly recall uh, Pete Cabrina being real um, down to earth and, and mentioning like, well, you know, if you really want to try it out, um, pack your bags and go. And I recall writing to the owner of, um, of um, a custom shop at the time here called High Tech. And the owner was uh, Greg Masonville. So I'd write him. And he, I was blown away. They would actually write back a handwritten letter saying, well, it's nice that you want to come here and, uh, and I appreciate that you have skills, but we can't just hire somebody in the Netherlands that's 15 years old and that says that they can hold an angle grinder and, uh, and, a, and a plastic squeegee. You have to show up and, and see how this works out. And um so, you know, half a year later, I, I sold what I had, which wasn't much, saved a couple dollars and packed my bag and left. But the attitude here is like, man, if you can, if you want to work, um, there's plenty of work, uh, you can make it work. And I love that opportunity. Um, as you know, in Germany, everything is spoken for, legalized, you need a permit to just about breed you know and, and that's how it is in the netherlands and here it's like oh you want to work you know how to do it here you go um and it, it was just a lot more simple that's yeah. awesome yeah and then how did you get that job with the angulos or the angulo factory um i first worked for a guy named mike tingler um that made the tinker tail and um tail, and yeah. jimmy lewis they showed me a lot of the tricks of the trade and um, 
at the time, Angulo would only shape his boards, but um, the, the thing to do was you shape the boards and you bring it to a glass shop. And I worked at the glass shop at the time that Angulo would drop his boards off. And so I kind of gotten in um, uh, at the, from uh, um, that Genesis glass shop that I worked for. Um, I do recall Ed seeing, uh, he saw me grinding his boards and he was like, who's this young kid? No flip-flops, bare chested, little paper mask on grinding my fin boxes of my boards. You know, he's quite reserved and, and didn't quite care for it. But I proved my, uh, my knowledge and uh, my attitude was fine. And finally squeezed myself into his shop because the, the glass shop uh, at the very end didn't work out. So he started his own, basically do it all in-house, which made sense because the company was growing and yeah. Yeah, awesome. And then, and then when you, when did you start SIC? What, when was that? Oh boy. Uh, I want to say, um, oh man, my memory is, is bad on that sense. 2004 or five, uh, okay. been a while. So that was before standup paddling was really, um, became popular, right? Yes, it was, uh, it was, with outrigger canoes i learned how to build outrigger canoes and right around that time i i decided uh, okay it's either going to be outrigger canoe that i'm going to pursue or stand up paddling and i was like all right there's this surfing thing is is more interesting um there was more growth in it and i wanted to just build better boards that that can beat outrigger canoes and that was my passion it's just build long boards with steering systems in it and we're going to go down the coast and and beat you know the kai barclets in the world which we never managed but we got close that's awesome and then stand-up paddling came around and you started um building hollow stand-up paddle race boards right yes yes uh, i knew that if i built complicated objects that are very large. Um, I can uh, stave off and, and hold back uh, Asia production for a bit. It's hard to uh, pay everybody that wants to work here 30 bucks an hour um, and run an operation and just still beat Asia prices that are that are uh, flooding the market. Because I've seen that, that, that syndrome on the windsurfing days, you know, you can build a really nice board, but at some point the stuff that's built overseas is such good quality and, and an unbeatable price that, you know, the, the end days are there. And so when I uh, uh, build a, a pretty complicated type of, uh, of means of building a hollow board that's really long and still lightweight and had the right shape, uh, um, I was in business. And so that kept me going for quite some time. Right. I mean, you were kind of in that position where, where you were able to get the best writers in the world to use your boards without paying them. People were actually buying the boards from you because just because that was the fastest thing out there. And if they weren't on one of your boards, it wasn't competitive. Yes. It was a luxury position. Um, I was there early and, uh, product was good and um yeah the whole quest uh, the m2o uh got me um out there on the world in the map uh i branched out and made different types of board the the 12 6 became popular real soon so worked on that um my passion always remained though the downwind the downwind stuff was like that's where i want to excel and still you know, it's still my uh, my escape in the big blue is is where uh, that's my my thing. And and you're saying it was you know it's hard to compete with with uh, Asian production and so on. So is that one of the reasons why you ended up selling SIC or I mean what what 
what happened there? Why, why did you sell it and how did that all work, work out? Uh, no, my, um, um, my, my forte, what I'm good at is, is tinkering and figuring out the next, the next best thing. I was forced to become a businessman, hire people and think about expansion because the, the demand was there, but I didn't enjoy it. Um, my most funny enough, my most miserable times running a business is was when the company was most successful. Um, but all I do was delegate and make decisions and think about the next best thing, best thing to keep employees, um, keep that grindstone going. And so I recognized that and it's like, man, why not give that, that, uh, that drive to somebody else that loves to expand a business. And at the time um, I met um, a guy, Anthony Scuturo, that wanted to run his uh, snowboard operations 365 days a year. So have like a, a ski season and then a summer season with something else. And he loved doing that part, his expansion, uh, conquering the world. And so we met up and we made a, um, I think a really good team. He ran with it and made it really big. And I stayed on as a designer. Um, I was more happy because I was able to let go of a bunch of employees and, and spend more time figuring out, okay, what's the next best thing? So, so are you now, are you now still a partner, like a minority partner, or are you just an employee of the, of SIC? Like you uh, just a designer or are you still a part owner? Neither. I'm the, cons I'm a consultant. Uh, I do, you know, three quarters of the design, um, of the models. Um, they're happy with me. I'm happy with them. If they if one day they're not happy with me, I probably, um, I'm asked to leave, but um, so far so good. It's been uh, almost eight or 10 years or something. I forget how long, um, but all good. They're happy with me. Uh, the, the company has switched owners, ownership once. It was part of the Shirio group, which owns JP, Neil Pride, uh, Cabrina. Uh, and those days, imagine, uh, anyway, a bunch of, uh, holdings that they had and now we're part of the we were part of the big big sports group and that really got sold again now we're part of Tahe um, and within all those changes I, I remain on board as a consultant for uh, SUP and now FOIL yeah. I mean nobody can argue with uh, that your boards don't work right so I mean they obviously perform yes. well and and the top riders are winning races and stuff like that. So that's, that's awesome yes. that you can continue that legacy and, yep. and live the life you want to live. Right. So that's, yep. that means a lot. So now, now your business is flying Dutchman, right? Um, yes. I started there. They allowed me to have a side brand on my own. Um, yep. And I still consult with SIC, design the boards, um, do photo shoots, do whatever, uh, they require of me or what's in my job description, but on the high end stuff and the custom stuff, they also allowed me to um, uh, express myself in, in that brand flying Dutchman. Yeah. So this, this is one of the latest uh, boards you've, you've built here a wing foil board. Uh, yes. Wing foil. Um, yeah. That one is five eleven by 30 for a, um, a bigger gentleman. Um, 130 liters i believe yes it is so it's, it says there right there um yeah yep yep bill this is uh pono bill on the stand-up zone stand-up yes. zone i think i think yeah. you posted that one on there too and, yes. and here's another one with a windsurfing track as well wing foiling yes <laughs> yeah so so and it looks like from like looking through your feet a little bit it looks like the bottom shapes you kind of simplified it from earlier designs where you had like um let me see here you had like uh more like these grooves in the bottom and things like that so what's your um latest philosophy on on shapes and oh and i also i wanted to ask you about these huge vent plug things um, so 
Talk okay. a little bit about okay. the board design yeah. and, and yeah, let's start with that board design. Uh, in the board that uh, currently is showing has a, a center channel that allow me to uh, angle the fin boxes further forward. Um, so it has a more uh, 90 degree angle to, uh, basically of where you're standing. I'd like my, my, my mass to be at the, at the right position so it doesn't suck down into the board on takeoff. And mm -hmm. I initially thought those, that center channel was gonna be um, good when you're paddling out on an SUP in the shallow area, the paddle blade would kind of lock in and you can paddle for a little bit, but that end up not being a good reason to build those those channels in there. Um, but anyway, they, they do allow me to have some natural rocker in the tail end of the board, but that center channel, I straighten out again. So it moves my mast in a, in a more optimum angle. And then those, uh, those sight um, on that blackboard that you just saw, I was trying to find a better way to, to make the board less sticky on occasional touchdowns. So experimenting with, with different um, ways to um, have less water wrap around the surface of the bottom. Um, so when you touch down, the water is not happy adhering everywhere. It, it's, it's more of a disturbance of, of the water flow. Um, it ended up being a pain in the butt to build uh, all those little <laughs> angles. Sure, yeah. um, so sometimes you got to do a bit of a reality check on what's feasible and what's uh, what still makes a bit of money. And so, and then uh, uh, I've been playing with convex bottoms. Uh, came the wild, one of the board with more of a rounded bottom. That that particular board has a convex mm -hmm. bottom um, for easy takeoff. That's an SUP board down uh, down the coast. And um, it seemed to work. It uh, it doesn't it doesn't stick so well. And when you have low speed, it has disadvantages too. I think when you do touch down, um, it does stick a little bit to it. It like wants to wrap around um, the entire bottom. But for downwind SUP on foil, the, the most important, the very most important thing is ease of takeoff. Because you can do a run, and if, if your buddies are on uh, on foil and you're not, you can be two miles behind, and that's super frustrating. So I moved yeah. my fin, I moved my fin boxes way forward so you can stomp on the tail and do an easy lift and a uh, bit of a convex bottom. Yeah. So and in, and this description you said it's kind of inspired by actually um, prone board shapes, right? The kind of that convex rounded bottom pin tail and fat nose is, is a lot like prone race foil uh prone yes, race board. yes if you think about it you know i i shaped quite a few prone boards in those days i never even thought about that but yeah um you need some glide forward um to get on foil and and so whatever it is to help you out is um and prone guys they move at relatively low speeds too so mm -hmm. yeah you do sacrifice some stability um but you do it does help you lift up awesome so i i, I saw this video here too like was this uh, when it was raining really hard like a month ago or so oh my god yeah yeah so my shop uh, my shop is in the in it actually if you had another half a mile down uh if you had a view my shop is in the bottom of where all this water is going oh. and so but there's you know 20 more properties with this amount of water so my shop was a disaster um, um but it was still there at the end of a couple days so but yeah i i parked it at a wet spot on the property but it's i also wanted to put it somewhere away from my house i didn't want to smell here or or anything so for sure yeah we had some rain yeah i'm sure you guys did too yeah it was pretty bad flooding here too yeah. we had actually sewage on our street <laughs> oh, we have like lovely, a pretty low lying lane so it was like oh the sewage was overflowing it was pretty yeah. disgusting yeah but um so what is this it says this was an experiment you tried yeah 
I, I, you know, you think of, I was struggling in the days uh, of downwinding to lift up. And so I was like, man, we need two foils in one. We need something that lifts up easy. But, um, and so I figured, well, a big front wing is going to, uh, it's going to help me uh, uh, get on foil. But then once you're up to speed, you want a tiny wing because you want to replace all that lift with forward momentum. So, you know, no rocket scientry. Airplanes do it. We all do it. I mean, even boats do it. But this idea is spring loaded. And so mm -hmm. that doesn't work because you need to be able to manipulate that flap. And, um, and it's also the left and right are independent. And so you really need um, a servo motor and all that. And it just became too complicated. And yeah, it, it, the, I, the I think there's actually a company that's trying to do like computer controlled uh, foils that have like that kind of lift control or something. But yeah, I could see how the, if the spring loaded, if you're if you're trying to pump up, it'll flatten out the it'll flatten it out. Right. So it doesn't yes. really work as well. Yeah. yeah bunch of work and i mean most of, i work on i continuously work on stuff and 80 percent of it doesn't work and 20 percent does and that's how i often operate i'm not really i don't have i'm not an engineer i'm not some people think i'm talented but not really i just try a lot and i am a persistent and and you know like 20 percent works and that that makes it somehow either into the marketplace or at least for me gives me um, um, an edge on my on my product that I bring out. Yeah, I mean, thanks for doing that. I mean, that's what we need, right? Some R&D yes. and, and it's like, and I talked to, you know, several other people about that too. You can't really predict how some, something's going to work until you're actually trying it, right? So, and if you never try something, you can't, discover something new that works right so you just have to experiment yes and so do you and so do we all and i i like people that are tinker and try and yeah but sometimes okay. people think like, like whatever you come up with it oh so it's, oh, it's magic it's like no not 80 percent is crap but you know <laughs> gotta try <laughs> <laughs> you tried it and it didn't work i mean the other thing too is like sometimes you think something doesn't work, but then it's maybe something else, right? Like, so you, yes. if you change two variables, you don't really know which one works and which one doesn't. So it's almost like you have to test only one variable at a time, really, to, to figure things out. Agreed. And uh, so what is your latest, uh, like, if you made yourself a new wing for a board today, what would you shape and how, what would it look like? Um, like perfect wing for a board. I would go back to what I shaped for Andrea Muller uh, about four months ago. It's it's a convex bottom, but it has uh, a section on the rails on the bottom it has a slight bit of uh, concave in it. It's like a. Um, I think what's happening is when you pump the the three or four pumps that you do before takeoff, you want the water to not not wrap around the deck, and so. Um, and you want crisp edges too upon touchdown if you occasionally, which we all occasionally do. Uh, uh, and so it's not really pictured there, but I would, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot like this board that is for cane. It's, it's the white point forward, pretty narrow tail. Um, uh, probably six one or six two. I'm I'm I want some length for downwinding. Um, Are you talking about this one here? Yes. So that okay. one's six, that that one's uh, five eleven or six foot. Um, a high high bow volume, medium rocker. Um, but the bottom is is a little bit more complicated than than this one is. Um, um, yeah, so six one, six two, maybe twenty five. I don't really have great balance uh, out on the uh, paddling out of Maliko. I don't want to paddle out on my knees or on my stomach. A lot of young kids now do. They ride boards that are twenty two inches wide. SUP can't do it. Uh, um, 
so I want to stand up and even when the wind dies or something, I want to comfortably um, paddle into the shoreline mm -hmm. um, on my feet, not on my stomach. Um, so you're talking about stand up foiling now or wing stand foiling? up, stand up stand foiling. Up foiling. Yeah, no, okay. Wing, okay. wing foiling. I, I write quite different boards now. We we're getting to the point where uh, the rockers are different, the outlines, volume distribution, straps, fin box placement, they're all quite different now. Um, before right. you can kind of mix and match, and you still can. You can wing foil on an SUP board. Um, but the sport is getting sophisticated enough to where um, they get their own dedicated design going. Yep. Yeah. So for wing foiling, what's your um, what's your perfect setup for that? Would you... um, like five foot by twenty five. Um, um, I ride single strap on the front only. Um, a bit of a contoured deck, but flat decks work as well. Um, um, I'm one hundred eighty pounds. I ride eighty liter boards. Um, because I still like to stand up when I uh, I don't water start all that much, yeah. So, and that that is too much volume for water starting. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. And um, and, so and pretty, kind of, actually, um, kind of. So what you use for wing foiling is pretty similar to what your stand up paddle board would be, yeah, like stand up surfing board. Did no, so the, the stand up surfboards oh. mine are 28, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, yes, yeah. they're quite a bit wider and they are um five eight, five six, five eight, because we got to get to the outer reefs like um outside Ka and mm -hmm. um or or like Pier One or um uh, outer Sprex. You need to paddle for three quarters of a mile, and so the shorter the shorter the board, the more they're like a skim board no directional stability so they are they have some more length um to them to get there my my, my sup foil boards yeah and then i've noticed so you said you use the front strap only is, is this one of your boards or oh, with a cork yes, deck, huh? yes. i've noticed yeah. your, your front strap is like really um it's like more than 45 degree angle there um you just like to have you kind of your front foot pointing pretty far forward with your toes forward. I, I, I've gone away from that actually. That is that board is a year old, but now okay. I'm more I'm more at a thirty degree, so quite a bit um, different angle actually. Okay, um, interesting. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know where I saw it, but somewhere I saw it, you had a board. Um, uh, that has like a, um, it has like a removable um, deck pad oh, or something. Pad. Or, yeah. yeah, I wish I can. Yeah. Um, it's it's part of my Instagram post, I think. Um, yeah. Trying to find it. Um, I I have it back here. Um, uh, if you want me to show you, it's oh, an yeah. idea. I, it's an idea I have. Um, I'll talk about it first, and I'll grab it. Okay. So when I take an order. It's, it's a fairly long discussion uh, when I ask details about foot strap placement. There'll be people that are saying, yeah, I, I want V configuration, but I also am goofy foot and I might do toe side. And so I don't blame people, but it's it, like you could put an endless amount of straps in it. And, and nowadays too, wing foil, you have narrower stance than SUP. And you have again a different center for downwinding. So I was like, ah, how how do I, how many inserts do I put in the board? So I came up with an idea of um, putting an indentation in the in the board in the shape a quarter inch, and I make a plate that is screwed onto the the board, and it has an, a, a large amount of holes in it. You can remove the plate, stick an excerpt on the back end of that plate. And so you have all these choices in foot strap placement. Um, I'll show it to you in a minute. But again, it's one of those ideas. You really need to tool up and do that uh, in a more economic fashion because it took me forever to build a product right. like it. And at the end of the day, I, 
I don't need to get rich and, uh, and, and rake in all the dollars, but I do want to play even at least when I run my, my business. So it's yeah. just not economic. And uh, also if you had to change your straps, you had to move these, this whole plate off in order to stick another excerpt in the back end of it. Um, mm. Let me see if I can grab the board and explain it. It's sure. Yeah. I'll wait. I'll wait. All right, so Mark's gonna grab a board to show us. All right, there it is. That's the board you're using right now. So yeah, my SUP board. Um, so it has this plate is actually a quarter inch deep. I don't know if you can really see it, um, but it has a bunch of inserts holding the plate back. Yeah, so I if can. You want to change? You want to change from goofy to regular? You got to remove this plate, stick a nut on the back end of that plate, and put the plate back down. But you do have a good amount of uh, choices in. It's kind of like a pegboard for your garage where you can put all yep. your tools on the pegs. Yeah. <laughs> That's there's, pretty cool. There's quite a few positive aspects to it. Uh, but the reality of making the economic, I don't know, maybe somebody will. Uh, I'm not yeah. going to. <laughs> and you have to take out all those screws to to move your foot strap a little bit. Yeah, uh, you can you can cheat by move. Uh, the plate is semi flexible. You can move, remove the maybe like eight screws and okay. get, get your hand underneath it and uh, and change the excerpt uh, to uh, yeah. a different hole. That's ingenious. I like it. Very <laughs> cool. So what what material did you use for the um, for the plate? Is it like a carbon fiber or? Yeah, it's a, um, a layer of uh, eighth of an inch PVC and then um, one layer of um, a polypropylene. Polypropylene, it's, it's really shatterproof. It's not a fiberglass or carbon fiber, but it is a material that you can drill through. Uh, it's not even polypropylene. It's a it's a it's a non-woven fiber that is good for um, micro cracking and anti shatter. And since there's so many holes there, I, that's a, that's a good material to use. And I mix it up with, with regular e, e glass. It's cork, um, polypropylene, PVC, and then carbon. And it has carbon bands in it as well to make it uh, torque resistant. Um, Wow. And then I have a little drill template to keep the, the hole symmetrical. And I all, make all that in a little mold and I wrap the EVA around it as well. Um, that's another cool thing is like you can, um, the EVA that is glued onto this, this plate that I call it is wrapped around the rails. So I find that since I repaired so many boards uh, in my early Dinkings days, I always see that EVA, the edges coming off because it's when you load it up on a car or you climb on the board, the edges just roll off. And gotcha. this way, this way is really glued on with uh, with epoxy and laminate, and it it's stuck really well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's like cool. Yeah, I was hoping I can um standardize it order the plates from maybe china or wherever some overseas company and then i would have all my boards with that plate but mm. i don't know so it's it's a one-man show that i run and and i sometimes don't have room or time to expand on my uh my ideas but um who knows maybe one day it comes back my my frustration still there with inserts and the amount of stands that are, are going around lately, people yeah. want two, two parallel straps on center line, um, two. And it's like, okay, you need quite a few inserts to, to get it right. Yeah, no, that's a, for sure. On wing foot boards, we have a lot of inserts in our boards and it does add weight and, uh, more points of failure possibly and stuff like that, you know, obviously. So yeah, putting just putting in more and more inserts isn't really the answer, right? So you just have to get them right, get it in the right spot. Yep. 
and they leak their their hard spot as you know and then and then the rest of your deck flexes and there they go uh, you know yeah. I've, I've repaired millions <laughs> so what about that those that plate could i guess if you put a like a little threaded insert into each of those holes it would just add too much weight if yeah you, that would be really the next step if somebody yeah. was if you give this idea to like a japanese guy to shimano or some german guy they would do it right they would do that and they would have an insert in it a helicoil and it would be taken to the next level um i think what i did is i bought um, a click bond excerpt and i stuck it literally with my hand underneath it mm. it's kind of mickey mouse it it needs to be taken to the next level and that is that is that some threaded insert yeah. well that's how it all starts right yeah that's awesome yeah. you're doing that very cool. So let, let's talk a little bit about foils. I, I know you started distributing uh, the Axis foils. How, yep. how, how did that come about? Like, how did you become the distributor for Axis? Um, I worked with the, old, the, the owner, Adrian Roper, uh, for, I don't know, since 30 years ago when, he, when we both lived here. So I've known him for a long time. Integrity, he's smart, experienced um knows overseas production and i find the kiwis to be quite innovative and uh he had experience already with uh, with kiting and foiling so and then he started he called me up and said oh, we're going to do this line for sup you want to be involved so in the early days i was involved with the development and uh then it all grew and then um, he took over the development with uh, a local team there and some Aussies. And uh, it just made sense for me to stay on board and start selling them. Uh, yeah, I needed something. Um, I tried on my own a little bit, but you can't build boards and build foils. And, you know, because you can't really build them here. It's just too costly. I built a couple of foils myself and a front wing took me two weeks to build i mean it would be a we a five thousand dollar wing or something like that would be ridiculous um right. um so um yeah i just started selling his stuff his stuff is good uh affordable i like the idea of components um and interchangeable um yeah plenty of choices so yes yeah Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, but but for wing foiling, what what wing do you use, or which, which wings do you use? What's your favorite, and what what like? L like we all did, we started big and thick, and now we're going smaller and smaller and smaller. And I've gone too small. Now I'm going um, uh, and 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 too much high aspect. I'm on a medium aspect now. Um, I'm on an eight ten um, uh, on the line list. Uh, or sometimes it's really, really windy. I go on a 700, which is, I don't know, 1,000 square centimeters. The 810 is maybe 1,100. Um, uh, and the same with the mast. I've gone with from, from 42 inch down to 36. But lately, I'm, I'm quite happy with 33 inch. I don't plow into the reef as much. Uh, the stuff, my whole setup feels a little bit more rigid than, than the longer mast. And... Uh, so 33 inch mass, pretty small rear. Um, what is that? 80 square or 60 square centimeters. Um, I want a 420 in, in their line. Uh, and then a short fuselage. I tried ultra short. It's a bit nervous at higher speed. So uh, I, I like a little bit of length on my, uh, my fuselage for uh, up and down uh, pitch control. Yep. Yeah. yeah, cool. That's uh, I've been using that 810 as well, the front wing, and that's awesome. I love that wing. It's like has a lot of lift actually like it. At first I was had a hard time controlling it cuz it kind of kept lifting up. I had to move it way back in my box and stuff like that, but I think yes. it's cuz that black fuselage too is longer in the front, right? So it puts the foil further in front of the mass. I I did find it in the beginning a bit nervous. Uh um too sensitive to my uh i'm not uh like a smooth suave cane the wild operator i i i stomp around a bit on the board and so the 
at times I, I'll go back to um, um, a, uh, a the 700, but even then it, that is 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 hard to write, uh, and that's why there'll be sessions that I have. It's like, oh man, sweet, I got it all figured out. I'm gonna write it in my logbook, and this is what I'm gonna write for for a couple months. And then the next day I'll go out. I was like, wait a minute, I was a rock star yesterday and today I'm like a kook again. So there's so many fine nuances, even between medium tight and low tight. I sometimes think, ah, oh, you're closer to the bottom of wherever you're riding and things press up onto your foil differently than the day before. Or there's, there's oil or contaminants on your foil where it's not riding the same way or um it is the day i i tell myself oh i got it all figured out is is the next day i'm proven wrong it's, there's a lot of nuances yeah in this sport that's for sure no doubt yeah so um so have you learned anything about the wings like that you like if you could design a wing or ask access to make a wing for you is there something you would change or like certain uh wing you would like to see in the future or something like that or any any ideas you have for foil design no i'm pretty for for my downwinding i'm i'm really happy with the 980 uh pretty versatile in in high wind um the um, i sometimes wish um things would be, uh, I don't know, uh, adjustable on the go, but I wouldn't know how. The engineering behind it is like, but I know that most other sports where they hydrofoil, things have control levels of some sort, uh, a moth uh, or uh, anything that has, has a bitch control to it, but we don't have that luxury. And as much as I want to tinker with it or ask Adrian, ah, how about this or that? Um, I see the Kailenis in the world, they make it work. And it's like, ah, oh, it must be me, the operator versus the equipment. But I always mm -hmm. think, ah, oh, if the equipment was, I don't know, uh, adjustable more. Um, I like the pitch control idea on the rear wing. I do, I currently do it with, um, pretty simple I, I put some beer cans uh, cut up into little snippets and i shim my uh, my rear foil by 64th or 32nd of an inch um and that much does change my behavior of my setup um anyway long story short actually, actually, that's like? a plastic shim too for the tail wing right as a, they have like a little plastic shim you can put on. Yeah, I the find them to be a lot. It's too much. You know, that that is like a, almost like one and a half millimeter. And yeah, I go in tiny increments and, and notice a difference. Um, and I do it the opposite. I want less lift. If anything, oh, so I you always put it in the front of the tailing and the front end. Yes, and they recommend in the rear, but uh, my, my, um, angle of incidence is like i don't know if it's up to me i do one or two degrees and and mm. they play with three or four mm. but i understand why if you do more you have i think in foiling the best way to do is if if um something has to win right the rear wing has to push the front wing up and if you do if there's not enough angle it's just too nerve wracking, but it's also faster. So if you have less drag from the rear, um, mm -hmm. and it's easier to control when you're going really fast, like it's less like to breach, right? If you have less tail wing angle. Yes. Yes. That's, that's a night. They, yeah. they're much nicer at high speeds to ride. Yes. yes. But lower, lower angle. Yeah. But it is hard to, harder to take off. I guess on Maui, it's not as much of a problem when you have a windy day. It's not, like taking off isn't so much of an issue, right? No, windy, it's, yeah. it's not. Nope. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then what about wings? Like what wings have you used? And I, oh yeah, I noticed too that SIC came out with their own wing. Do you have any involvement in that wing design or talk yeah. a little bit about the wings? Yes. So I help SIC with the, their feedback on their, 
on their wings. We work with a, a German company that has a lot of experience in uh, the kite, kite world. Their name is Core, C-O-R-E. Uh, they have a good in on um, really good fabrics uh, and they, uh, they design the wing. So I help them with um, the aspect of it, uh, low, medium or high aspect in the wing foil and the handle placement. Um, uh, window, no window, all that stuff. It, it's not like I'm a designer and I, I don't know enough about wings to, to say this is what you should do, but I, I at least tell them uh, yay or nay on uh, the prototypes they send me. They send me the prototype straight from, uh, I think it's Sri Lanka to here. And um, I write a report and then they build another one. So um, yeah, I, I help with... Um, both the hydrofoil part and the wings themselves. Yeah. So, what do you like, um, or you know, what what do you think is important in in the wing design, and and what do you do to make it work well? So, I'm personally not a speed demon, so I like um, I don't like my tips to drag uh, too much. So, in terms of aspect, I I don't like it high aspect. Um, I'm willing. I'm willing to sacrifice some speed and upwind ability for uh, ease of use in the surf. Um, I like an Australian brand um, by the name of Smick. Uh, they're lightweight. Um, I think I would make building my own booms for for that particular wing. But when push comes to shove, that that's another project. There's just too much work. So the handles, the webbing handles, um, are fine by me for now um the um uh, yeah again their fabric is pretty decent um i don't care for windows they wear out too fast um i think in general the earlier generations of of wings out there are of a mediocre fabric quality and they bag too fast they um they form like a a cup right before the trailing edge so you your wing might look good but the feel of it um it doesn't have good release anymore so a lot of wings i get maybe 100 hours out of them and then uh, i don't know what to do with them i give them 400 bucks to a friend or something but they, they kind of want to get baggy and, and backwind on your kind of flap back at you right when you go yeah upwind. flap and and uh, lots of pull, but no forward drive. It, 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 to uh, to summarize it, it they just trying to find out. this picture of you um, with a boom on your wing. But I don't know. I saw it somewhere. I like this one by Leonardo da Vinci. That that's oh, one of your uh, influences. <laughs> yes, that was that's an amazing guy, huh? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yes, way ahead of his time. Okay, yeah, no there, there's one of them I see there, an early version, the white one. Oh, this one. Okay. Yes. That is my uh, so, yeah. first generation. <laughs> so you you worked, I mean, obviously as a long time windsurfer like me, um, having a boom is just seems more natural than having handles, right? So is that yes. why you wanted to try out uh, a more rigid boom type of thing? Yeah. Um, that and... Um, uh, when you're learning tricks and fumbling with uh, your uh, uh, your transitions, it, I think uh, you know a four foot piece of pipe is just easier to find than uh, than the webbing, and um, um, it's easier on my fingers. And for my wife, who's a massage therapist and are, have has beaten up finger joints, uh, the boom is also easier than the webbing. Um, and I think for downwinding too, for uh, uh, ultimately for uh, control in, in just give yourself just a tiny bit more horsepower. I think the boom is better than the, uh, than the webbing because uh, you can kind of turn it on maybe 10, 15% by uh, pitching the, um, the handle better. Yeah, but I do have, I, I built some other ones that are uh, even more ergonomic. Uh, than, than that first generation but again you gotta all build it um in a in a in a fashion that, that makes economic sense uh, and since i'm not 
I'm a composite guy. I'm not a sale guy, um, mm. but I did want to try it and learn from it. Um, yeah. So talk about this. Is this a mo hollow molded foil board? Is that what you're building there? Yep. Yep. And so the um, only foam inside is kind of where the inserts go, where the screws inserts go or what? Yes, where your heels go and where the fin boxes and inserts go. There's that uh, blue insulation foam. Mm -hmm. Yep. And everything I'm trying else to build a board that's also a little bit more uh, environmentally green. Um, the amount of waste I produce uh, is staggering on a custom board it's it's you know we're in a disgusting industry and so when i look at the waste going into a, a hollow molded board it's very minimal um i can put every little scrap piece of cloth in there um i use um virtually every single inch of that blue foam um it doesn't absorb water um, um it's well sealed the gel coat's tough um, but obviously you're stuck into one model and um, the industries uh, and what is hip today is is outdated tomorrow so it's hard to build uh, a bunch of molds to uh, satisfy that demand for sure especially foiling is still so young i think and changing so fast that um definitely yeah. changing oh my god it, fashions right so it's it hard to just about yeah. changes daily right yeah, yeah i guess it's a matter of what's popular too whatever the the top guys are riding that's what everyone else wants to be on and they think they're going to be better if they have that same board right yep <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so actually so what what actually what, what's your philosophy on that like you know a lot of times i i see people spending so much money on equipment and then they think I'm going to just buy it. My board is too heavy. I need a lighter board so I can take off easier or whatever. And then, you know, they spend even more money to buy another board and instead of, you know, maybe taking a lesson for a few hundred dollars, you know? So I don't know. What, what's your take on that? I, I think sometimes people put way too much importance on the equipment and not enough about, you know, it's, it's just like easy to blame it on the equipment and not your own skills. Right. I, I agree. Uh, yeah and i tell people too it's like man maximize what you own right now and don't order anything from me or anybody else for that matter um till you have outgrown it um because um i mean obviously i like money and i like to take orders and, and i have a certain pride in making a product but i don't need the work i i, I just want the work but um Yes, I, I encourage people to uh, either rent a board. Uh, for one, in my, my custom boards, I, I hardly ever build a board that's for a first-time user. It's usually people's third or fourth purchase because they yeah. already know a little bit uh, about the sport. And then they're like, okay, I need better performance. I need something tailored to me. Um, and that, that includes colors and, and insert placements and, and stuff. But... Uh, 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 and obviously my stuff is quite a bit lighter out there than whatever's available, but uh, some beginner guy should be happy with a fiberglass board and, uh, and a thick foil and, uh, and learn on that. Uh, I was, works fine, worked fine for me till you get better and, um, and want to take it to the next level. Only then um, losing a few pounds and, um, and having it shorter makes sense. Yeah. yeah definitely for like the high performance guys it makes sense to get the the best you can buy i mean you you don't want to be i guess like in stand-up paddle racing i always used to say you don't want to lose because you didn't have the right equipment right so you want to be on whatever the best equipment is and in racing sometimes it comes down to just a few seconds so having that yes. small advantage can make it a big difference yeah but if you're just cruising for fun then I think um, just make make whatever you have work and learn and before you until you know what you what the next step is and what you need next yeah, and then yeah. get then get a good board. Don't get an expensive board as a beginner board for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any other tips for people that are getting into it? A lot of people are, that are watching are actually just getting into it or don't don't even have any equipment yet and so on. So what, what 
pointers do you have for someone starting out? Um, yeah, I, I taught my wife uh, day one and two was on an SUP board, a nine foot board, big thing. Uh, learn wing control, the, the wing above the water. Um, learn about that. But at some point, you got to get away from uh, something without the foil. And then, um, I don't know, day number three, four, five, uh, harbor talented or conditions are uh, short mast, uh, big front wing, a pretty long fuselage, um, big rear too. If you can borrow or rent, good, because you're going to outgrow that equipment in no time. Um, mm -hmm. But baby steps after that. And then slowly start going uh, smaller front, slowly replace the, the lift with speed. Um, but it would be nice if you can find um, either borrow stuff or um, I don't know, uh, because the, the stuff that you learn on is you're going to outgrow it really fast, but there's no way you can learn on advanced equipment because uh, it doesn't have enough lift and the masts are too long. So if you can take a lesson and, and the school has equipment available um, that's good for learning, you're financially better off and you can learn faster by uh, having a forgiving equipment um, that includes the board, you know? If you're, I think 130 liter board is, is, is good for the first couple weeks, months, and then ultimately you can you can move into 100 liters, 80 liters, or 50 liters. Uh, but baby steps, um, and it is a bit of a you kind of need the right equipment though to um, to do those baby steps. Uh, and uh, a lot of people, I feel like they there's a fear factor in, in the wings and. Um, and, and being able to, to get away from it if you fall. Um, I've never been hit by uh, a wing really. And so maybe sharp edges are, are, are not a go. I tried making wings with rubber front ends. So if you get hit, um, it doesn't hurt or doesn't cut you, but it still really hurts if you uh, get hit with something with rubber on, at a certain speed. You're talking uh, about the foil wing now, right? The, the yeah, the foil, foil wing. Yeah, the foil wing. Um, so um, falling away from the board, um, taking a lesson, and uh, more than anything, I, I tell people when they when they learn is breed. It's a, it's a, a, a lot of the sport. This sport, I find, it's about feeling, and it's not about muscle or uh, trying harder. It's about feeling that that piece of equipment underneath you. And what it does uh, at certain speeds forward, and um, and relaxing. I think the foil, the hydrofoil, also knows when when your calves and your thighs are tensed up, and and things are not working. But the more relaxed you are, which is unfortunately in most sports the truth, um, but this one especially, the harder to try, the worse it will get, and the more relaxed you are. Um, the better you'll get it. Yeah, hundred percent agree with that. Um, like I, I interviewed this guy Sam Loader from New Zealand. He says through his shop, he's he's planning to uh, lease beginner wing foil boards to people so they can lease a board, and then once they're out out of that beginner stage, then they can basically return it to the shop and they can lease it to someone else. Which I thought was kind of a good idea. It's it's a nice thing for the sport, eh? To yeah. have that. Uh, option yeah i think it's uh man it, it, if you lived in an area what's that's forgiving for 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 uh, for learning um we're kind of stuck with a mediocre place for learning maui is a windy place but it's not a great place for learning because we're we we'll go to the harbor and it's blowing 10 knots and then just outside um the spit here it's blowing 30 so it's gusty hmm. uh but uh, yeah, if you lived in like Barbados or wherever, maybe even Oahu, I don't know where you guys, I can see Kailua being kind of friendly for learning. 
Kailua is not, really onshore and kind of bumpy, so rough water. Oh, so it's not okay. actually ideal for learning, I think. But um, we have this one place by Sand Island, which is like where the wind blows straight offshore and it's just like smooth water. And then there's um, like an island on the other side. So you can't blow, get blown out too far. Basically, you, you, you get to the other side and then you have to paddle back if you get blown offshore, you know. So it's yes. pretty safe, and but it's, the water's smooth, and that's a good place to learn. Except that it's pretty gusty too because it's offshore wind. Yes. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and then yeah, another good tip I think is to just go downwind, like have a you know park cars downwind, and then just go downwind, so you don't have to worry about staying upwind, which is probably one of the hardest things to do at first. Yes. Yeah. We all do the walk of shame, whatever you call it. Um, yeah. And that's the beauty about the harbor, at least. The walk back is, is not treacherous or along rocky cliffs. It's just along a beach. And um, But you all got to pay your dues. And yeah. Yeah. So what, like, are you working on any new tricks or do you have anything that you can share, like technique wise, like any good pointers on learning to jive or tack or learning tricks and moves and stuff like that? Um, I'm learning the um, attack. Instead of bringing your wing uh, above your head, you put it behind your back. So mm. it's a, um, a, a hand grab type of tack. But I got to work out the um, how I deal with my leash. I get tangled up with my leash. So I got to almost throw my leash behind my back, and then I can do the, the tack. Um, because la uh, lately I've been practicing without a leash, but that's kind of irresponsible. But um, um, I love that I've... move, by the way. I, I actually made a video about that. That the, I call it the behind the back tack, where into a, tacking into the wave. It's a really good move, you know. Yes. Yeah. What do you do with your leash? Tell me. Well, you know, like when I when I tack into the wave, basically I have to tack back out of it. You know, like I have a, I have a waist leash, so it the way the leash gets wrapped around me so then if i if i end up jiving out of it then i i can't jive out of it i basically have to tack back out of it like when i, I tack onto in, the wave the and sense. then if i tack back out again then the wing the leash goes out the same way it came in you know okay so you live with the tangle for a bit for for one uh okay got it yeah Yes, uh, and then, and then um, if you have it on your wrist. You can maybe try to put it on the other wrist that you. Um, I don't know. Maybe I don't know if that works. <laughs> I've no, not really it. tried it. But yeah, if you have yeah, a waist leash, you can also, if once you're on the wave, you can sometimes get your hand underneath it and kind of pull the leash over your head, you know, and then you have it back in the normal position. Okay. Okay. I don't know. That's a, yep. But that's a tricky part of that move, yeah, for sure. Yep. And then. Um, it's time for me to learn how to uh, ride with a harness because uh, the upwind, uh, the long reaches to go upwind to, to ultimately come downwind again is, is a little hard on my uh, on my forearms. You know, when we go, I don't know, three, four miles upwind. It, it uh, takes a bit of uh, uh, grunt work. And... Um, uh um, do, do you what, keep your feet in the same stance or do you switch stance on your board uh, i do both i can do switch stand or uh toe side in toe side when i go downwind or in the surf i don't have time to switch so i'll, I'll do toe side but if i make long reaches i you gotta you can't go upwind as well toe side i find right. just the yeah. angle is not there why i don't understand but it's like a 15 degree difference between toe side and um uh natural stance uh, going upwind yeah 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 so what else do i no i um i i, I thought of it. i'm gonna learn how to jump i put inserts in my last board but the jumping thing i don't know it's not my it's not my thing uh um Better, harder carving in in, uh, in riding downwind waves is is fun. Um, that's really kind of a basic guy. I like tacking. I like jiving. I like I do duck jive, but I'm not a trick master. I do 360 backside, like where I'm toe side, and then I go with my back 
into the wind and then come out again. Um, so your skills on the water, would you say it's, it's uh, like naturally God, natural God given talent that you have, or is it just practice or what, what helps you get better? Hell no. I think I'm a klutz. Uh, <laughs> no, the, the, the whole thing with talent, if you look at the guys that are really good, I, I am 90% sure they're really good because they try really hard. Um, uh, the guys I look up to is like the Kalamas or, or lately with this new sport is Kane DeWald. Uh, they're out there virtually six days a week um, from one o'clock till sunset. And so they pay their dues and uh, time put in is, is skill uh, skill set learned. Um, sure, there's there's you know, it does help to learn a little bit about, to know about outrigger canoes and catching bumps. And, but now with this new foiling thing, we ride a different section of the wave anyway. We ride the back side of the wave where with outrigger canoeing or SUP, you, you ride the front side of the wave. Um, the energy available to us is at a different place in the ocean. So that part is really not all that helpful. Um, even the surfing part, uh, with SUP, you tend to be go a little bit slower with the wing. You now you suddenly have a couple more horsepower, so you gotta um, you gotta manage that speed and and power that you got in your hand and get rid of it in a way. So um, anyway, no uh, things don't come naturally to, natural to me. Um, I try hard, um, and I look at other people and. Sometimes I copy and sometimes I do, I create my own style. Yep. So I wanted to ask you about this. Um, you know, this, this is kind of going backwards, but you know, a few years ago I did the 11 cities tour and I was doing some research and I saw these pictures of you um, using this yes. board. And I want, I've always wanted to ask you about that, but so it looks like you're standing, like you're pretty much standing on the bottom layer of the board is that correct like pretty much yes. it's hollow board with with and you're standing on the bottom so how did that work and what was your experience with that well um i, I had to get i wanted to write um, a lengthy board i thought uh, glide would be important and this was the first 11 city tour and so uh, two piece was uh, mandatory because you can't really get a 16 foot object in the plane with you um, so I needed, I needed a way to, uh, create a rigid connection and then, um, so some thickness did help. And then instead of building it hollow, I built this, this master, this, um, piece of styrofoam that I wrapped a skin around it. And my wife at the time, uh, got the identical board. So at least I was using the master for more than one board. Um, so I wrapped a skin around it and I put a deck on top of it. And I built a compartment so the board wouldn't sink in case um, uh, it would take on water. So the front, um, the manu, as they call them, with a, with a, I think with a six man, the front area had buoyancy. But yes, you were standing on the bottom of the board. And I put a little steering system in it for cross breeze. Uh, it was pretty rounded, kind of almost like canoe-like. It's a pretty decent board. Um, uh, part of it was the operator. Me, uh, I didn't practice very much in flat water. It's just not my thing. I'm too busy either I don't know, surfing or building boards where I'm never diligent enough to either get my nutrition right or my, my, uh, my cardio right. Um, but I had fun building them. I left them there and uh, I managed to get them there because they were two-piece, so they were eight-foot. Um, that's the history behind those, uh, those two words I brought with me. These boards, where did they come apart? Is like right in the middle? Right in the middle. Uh, yeah, they, they have hard inserts, um, in them and they have, uh, no, actually not, not in the middle. I think just slightly forward of center. They, uh, right at the edge of the Manu, they were coming, coming apart. Okay. Do you have pictures of them there? 
Yeah, um, I, I don't know. Can you see the screen sharing right now? You can't see that? No, I cannot. Oh, wait. Yes. So, yeah, uh, they were coming apart right in front of my toes, That um, right at front of the, the steering. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But anyways, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So you were able to take it on the plane with you even, huh? Yes. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, because that's not easy to travel with a big stand-up race board. <laughs> but yeah, that that's a tough race for sure. The 11 Did you enjoy race. it? Yeah, it was fun. It was super nice. Um, just staying with everybody on the boat too and having your stuff on the boat and going from one town to the next. I mean, it's, it's a definitely a cool experience. Can de definitely recommend it for anybody. Yes, it's pretty. Yeah, that, that uh, it's old, you know, 15, yeah. 16th century uh, um, uh, villages that you go through. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful places, yeah, with the windmills everywhere and then going through the countryside and stuff. It's like a, yeah, it was definitely a cool experience, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to um, kind of the learning and um, mental aspect of, of it a little bit. Like you talked earlier about, you know, some days everything's perfect and you're Superman and then the next day uh, you're a kook again. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, sometimes it's the equipment maybe, but I mean, I think a lot of times it's just down to your mental state, your, you know, what state of mind you're in and so on. And it seems it's like sometimes everything's like uh, works perfectly and you just like in a groove and everything clicks and you're in tune with the waves and the wind and everything. And other yeah. days you're just not. But is there anything that you do to get into that state of mind or do you have any tricks on kind of getting getting there and not being a kook <laughs> uh <laughs> no i don't uh, i wish i did uh, i wish i was more in tune with uh um uh, getting into that zen moment um it's awesome when it's there when you have a good time and your equipment works um and i with SUP, I can more so than with wing foil. Um, I, to be honest with you, no, Robert, I don't have that uh, that control of when I'm going to get a, a Zen session out there. Um, sometimes I think, oh, I, li I live too much of a rushed lifestyle, too much on my mind. Um, I often juggle uh, several projects uh, in a week and we all do and i sometimes think oh that's that's my nemesis i gotta just have more leisure time but sometimes i try to cram a session in and and i have an awesome time and i sometimes have all day and it's crap so no nope, mystery okay yeah this, i wish i knew what the magic formula was too you know yeah hey, that's, I, why, that's you, why i ask you can, everybody you can sell me a <laughs> sell me a pill or a booklet <laughs> yeah, i'll nice. buy it <laughs> okay so do you have other hobbies that you do other than you know water sports or like do you have anything that you do for inspiration i mean you mentioned reading already but anything else that you like to do in your free time or yeah, I like I like bicycling. Um, it allows me to even in a straight, fairly boring road that I often do. My, I, I get my thoughts uh, in place and and um, uh, it clears me. Um, I used to go to an, an early morning to a gym. I haven't gone there for now since COVID for a while. Um, but sometimes some um, some some fairly boring exercises uh, would get my uh, all my my thoughts um, more aligned. Um, so the bicycling I like. Um, I used to be into free diving, but I haven't done I haven't done that for for too long, forever. Um, I like to hike, uh, bike. Um, no, I'm pretty much a workaholic. I, I love my shop, so I don't look at that as work um even in my in my planned holidays my wife is in charge of my schedule um i happen to have like holiday this week i'll still go down to my shop and tinker with stuff that i want to build that's really my passion and 
really I'm really not all that good in many other things. Um, but um, no tinkering and bicycling. That's about it. Well, yeah. I mean, I think tinkering with stuff and working with your hands and building things is very therapeutic for me too. I love I love doing that. And I think a lot of yeah. times when you work on a computer and stuff like that, you you miss out on that actual like the physical working yes. with your hands. You know, even if you design a board on the computer, it's not the same as touching it and and building it with your hands. You know, I think yes, the difference. Yeah. Between. yeah. Um, so I mean, you kind of already answered this, but I always ask people like, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of people, you know, got stuck inside and had to change their routine and, and a lot of people felt lonely, depressed, or, you know, isolated, anxious yeah. and so on. So if you, if you're having a bad day, like, is there anything, anything you do? I mean, you said bicycling, walking, hiking, basically just taking your mind off things or do you have any other things that you like to do or recommendations? Yeah. I, I, I find it sad that um, not much was discussed about the good parts of um, the pandemic in terms of uh, uh, what it, it was also able to possibly give people. Um, we all live rushed lifestyles or, or, I'm guilty of it at times, and I feel like um, I share it with other people. And I think, um, especially in the early days, the pandemic um, had um, gave less traffic on the road, um, more uh, freedom to pursue um, things you can do outside. Uh, suddenly, there was less work um, that had to be done. Um, government checks were coming in, uh, support. Um, so we're always talking about the ne negative things of, of COVID. And of course, it's, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, people got sick and died. Um, but I do think um, we, we were finally given time to ponder about our own lives or read more or watch a sunset, uh, sunrise, uh, be outside. And I don't know, we, we wanted to go back to where we came from pre-pandemic but not everybody was always happy with that so it's like wait a minute there's an opportunity for change uh let's let's grab it and but i, I don't know a few people did and and maybe the people wing foiling uh, going out surfing yeah we did um but i don't maybe in the inner city if you live in detroit in in, in the fall or winter yeah um my story doesn't work. Uh, we live in Hawaii, obviously uh, sunset or sunrise uh, or being outside does work. Um, but there's, there's things that you can do um, uh, when um, physical distancing was required. Um, uh, I feel, um, get away from the computer, um, you can still be outside, I, I think, even if you, uh, even during the pandemic. I, well, there were people with complete lockdown where you couldn't even go outside. And so I'll take that back. But there's not that many places that had that much restriction. Um, mm -hmm. um, anyway, I felt like we all want to go back to where we came, where what was what before, uh, before the year and a half. But it wasn't that great for some people anyway so maybe uh not not many people grab the opportunity for change um that's where, how i see it. it the news especially it was all about the bad news and the negative aspects and man i'm just over it i i did recognize that the news is like uh, uh driving down negative news to sell to sell more papers and and neither am i one that has conspiracy th theories or believe doesn't believe in masks or vaccine i'm all pro that and and getting over the, the disease and 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 mass immunity is it would eventually be a good thing um it's kind of a long-winded answer but um um, I do feel like, you know, you can still be outside. Yeah. Yes, we can be in the water, but 
um, yeah, or pursue a hobby, uh, learn how to cook better, or whatever it is that you never had time for. Yeah, hundred percent yep. agree. I mean, I think what you said too. I think here in Hawaii, a lot of people realized how nice it is when there's no tourists everywhere and less rental cars on the road and just having, you know, and like I was talking to my wife too. It's like, why do we need to go back to having, you know, 30,000 people coming every day when maybe it's better to have 15 or 20,000 people arrive every day. You know, we, yes. maybe we don't need the, you know, it's more about the quality of the tour the people that come not the quantity right uh, yes. so i don't know it's, but it's a difficult a difficult question you know but do we uh, do we really want to go back to how it was before you know there's a lot of definitely there was a lot of good things that happened during the pandemic too yes so I totally agree with that yes so um what about foiling like i you know i i like to call myself a foil addict or you know kind of crazy you know almost obsessed about foiling for at least i mean it seems like when i first got into foiling i was obsessed by it and then when i got into wing foiling the kind of same thing happened i was totally obsessed again and do you feel that way and do you think there's like a a, a dark side to that or a downside to being that obsessed about something um well i'd love to have a bigger garage so i could store more <laughs> <laughs> and I thought windsurfing is bad with the amount of equipment that I had. And then people were like, oh, yeah, small board, one wing. It's all good. But it's pathetic how much gear I have now. <laughs> so that's that would be the dark side is the amount of money I, uh, I spent. And I get my stuff cheap um, and I make half the stuff myself. But yes, yeah. I'm an addict and, and I'm absolutely blown away that what we do, the sport is is even possible. I feel like I live in a science fiction movie we ride this wave that is like i don't know 12 inches tall and we ride it for half a mile or a mile it's like i never even dreamed of it even with an outrigger canoe you couldn't do it and it's like the energy that you can harness it's like it's staggering it's awesome and uh the silence that you suddenly are given no more chatter from the board of hitting the surface, the hitting of the ocean. It's like, and you can discuss, you can describe that to a surfer and it's like, yeah, but you're not in touch with this, the ocean anymore. And it's like, you haven't done it yet, have you? They don't know. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's okay. Cause you know, um, but anyway, I find it, uh, it's a mind blowing sport and I'm super stoked that uh, I learned this and I was in a, period that i learned it from pretty crappy equipment to now pretty decent equipment um it's so much fun and yes i'm an addict and um yeah, yeah. sometimes i describe it as kind of uh, almost having superhuman abilities like the foil makes you feel like kind of like batman with a flying suit or something like that like you can do stuff that nor mere mortals can't do yeah, yes. <laughs> I don't know. Something like that. Yes. That's the feeling yes. you get, right? And yeah, and seeing the America's Cup in New Zealand um, several months ago. And I mean, those guys take it to another level. They, I think it's 12 knots and they're going 40, 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour. It's just like, there is no way that, that anything like that is possible, even four or five years ago. And those mm -hmm. catamarans five years, four or five years ago in the Caribbean were still top of the line and now with those single hulls with those arms coming out it's like no uh, chance it's just uh, mind-blowing yeah and the, and the video footage available and um yeah and i'm stoked that the winging brings the foiling to the masses because i think if it was up to sup and prone um the the sport would have a limited potential to uh uh, to transcend but now i think the wing you know we, we can grab now we can grab hardcore surfers that never that laughed at windsurf or wind sports in general they are laughing at it. it's like man that's for kooks and now hardcore surfers are like oh this looks fun i can do this where the sup straight sup without the fall was never able to do that 
the, the yeah, hardcore surfers cool looked at the surfers. SUV board and it's like, man, what's this dorky, big, giant piece of foam doing? But now surfers are switching to, to this. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think especially like they, they get into it through prone foiling, prone foil surfing. And then once they try a wing and they get that experience of just flying on the floor the whole time and not having to yeah. paddle anymore, it's like that's yeah. like in a whole nother dimension. Plus being able to do it anywhere in the world, right? You don't need a wave. You don't need a boat. You can just grab a wing and yeah. go wing foiling. I do, I do feel like it's a, it's a bit of a financial... Um, uh, not struggle, but it's an expensive sport, huh? To get some decent yeah. equipment, you're you're at it forty five. A, it also takes up a lot of space. Yeah, like if, especially if you try to leave the foil and the board together, you, then you need a van or something. <laughs> and yes. it's like yeah. like yeah. it's definitely not a cheap sport and not something you know if you want to really just be a beach bum and and uh, you know work at a bar or something like that and and be on the water all day. It's so hard to do that yeah. to yeah. to spend that kind of money on. It's more, it seems more like a sport for wealthy professionals. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's, like that, that is the bummer part that that will be a limiting factor on making the sport even bigger. Because uh, if you think about it, as some decent, the full setup is close to 1500. The board, maybe they'll come down to like, I don't know, under a thousand, but most of the stuff is 1500. So mm -hmm. now you're at three, and then you kind of want two wings that's another 1500 so now you're at 45 so uh, yeah. i don't know that's and then you kind of want oh you want to buy another front wing now you're at five thousand um, dollars yeah and the, the funny thing is that everybody that gets into it they're very they're very very price conscious about everything and they want to yeah. spend the least amount of possible and so on and they, they're trying to stick to their budget but then mm -hmm. Once they get hooked on that feeling, all of a sudden yeah. that all the budget doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> they just, they just, <laughs> just yeah. whatever the best thing they can get, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Then all of a sudden the, the budget doesn't matter. Yes. But somehow they figure out how to do it. Yeah. But anyways, is there is there anyone you want to thank for supporting you over the years or that's helped you out or um yeah, I mean, um, I really enjoy the days of, of learning how to uh, downwind foil with Alan Cadiz and Ken Winter. And, um, you know, Ken would go out with us uh, down Malika runs, but he threw out his arm, um, his shoulder. And so he tinkered with uh, some other way to join us. And so he came up with this 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 idea and I kind of laughed at him for half a year or so. And what, we didn't even have a name for those things. We call it wing ding thing, whatever wingy. And then I was like, ah, that sport is kind of goofy. And what's this, this thing in your hand? Why not just go with a paddle? Um, so, I mean, he was persistent and he made it all work. And um, uh, he put that sport on the map. So uh, I enjoyed being there when that happened um, and seeing it all grow. Um, other than that, appreciation, yeah. It's everybody that, that tinkers and try to make the equipment better, I, I, I always um, I, I am appreciative of, of, of whoever comes up with a better piece of, uh, of gear. Um, and it comes from all over the world. You know, France is quite busy doing, uh, and they've been at it early with hydrofoiling, uh, mm -hmm. earlier than, than in Hawaii, I think. And mm -hmm. then in River, they're trying really hard and um, we try hard. Um, we have the luxury of no seasons, so um, and quite a few innovative, out of the box thinkers um, in all the islands. So that's cool. Uh, yeah. No. So, so who who can you recommend to speak to uh, on this interview show? Like, who else would you recommend to to talk to? Um, for wing cool foiling in particular. Uh, it'd be cool. I don't know if he did Ken already, but he's he's an important guy. I've been, and I've been emailing with him, but he says he's too busy. But at some point, I'm going to try to get him on Ken Winner for sure. Because yeah, uh, yeah, Alan, I mean, Alan just... Cadiz talked about that too, like how he started with the wing. And at first it seemed silly, but then he saw him like 
jiving back and forth and it looked like uh, poetry in motion he said so you that's when he wanted yeah. to try it <laughs> yeah. maybe send uh, ken winner some really good uh, uh, piano music in a cd or two so you can entice him he'll have a laugh at that he'll be like how did you know that i uh piano ken's music. passion is piano he okay. plays he plays really good piano music uh he has a uh uh, grand piano in his living room maybe have a laugh at it and because he's very much does not want to be in the limelight he does not enjoy camera work and he chose it that way for a reason and so right. it'd be hard to get him on an interview like this hmm. um but he does earn his uh he uh he should because he he brought it he brought this sport to all of us um there's a there's a, some guys in australia that are that are trying hard there's a guy that i buy my uh, my wings from um his name is um um he used to work for starboard um um oh, the guy that does make um McCurcher, yeah. McCurcher, uh, um scott uh, mccurcher scott mccurcher it would be cool um lincoln dues is is kind of a cool character he does a lot of the uh sailing uh boat delivery uh, sailboats mm -hmm. um 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 let's see winging for winging or hydro foiling um maybe some girls get get some female yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a really good um uh female um maui athlete annie i don't know her last name any record she, i already i already yeah. interviewed her yeah oh sorry sorry didn't That's see okay. that one um yeah. um and that's, Glenelle is here on Oahu. She's really good too. But yeah, I, I think I mean that, that's I definitely want to interview women too, not just men for sure. Uh, and then uh, uh, Andrea Muller, she, another oh, girl that 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 would be open to it. Um, kind of a legend, you know, with with SUP, big wave, and now winging. Um, yeah. She's probably a force to reckon with. Where the downwind uh, comes comes into play. Um, yeah. She's training long distance, falling. Um, I can give her your. Uh, I can give her the your con the contact to you. Um, mm -hmm. Who else? Who else? Who else? Man, that, get that's, a, that's a good list already. I just yep. need Thank you. So you know, like usually when I when I check the Google Analytics for the video only about 5% of the people actually that click on the video are still watching now. So do you have any special message for the, the foil crazy people that are still watching? Um, <laughs> um, if you're, if you're, an, if you're a novice, um, it's a hard, um, thing to wrap your head around, but at some point, um, getting smaller, just equipment, just big enough is, is, is the goal get rid of lift and and replace it with forward speed um and it sounds a little vague but um a higher aspect wing um thinner uh shorter fuselage smaller rear thing a uh, wing and um um the right board just enough volume because the the bigger boards are hard to control all that area in front of the the wing the, the hydrofoil wing is 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 board that is moving you up and down and harder to control so get get your equipment down to just enough size um, um yeah if somebody wants to learn um maybe lend them your stuff uh, send them to the right place too don't send them into an area that you enjoy right now but send them to a beginner place because you got to remember that we're all beginner kooks out there and so it's important to not intimidate people by by giving them too advanced of equipment i think um uh, yeah what else can i that's uh, all good advice so if yeah. somebody wants to order a custom board from you how how long does it take and what do they have to do and around how much can you expect to pay for a custom wing foil board um, it depends on volume. They start at uh, a prone board. Start at I believe a thousand, and a, and a SUP, a big SUP downwind board would 
run all the way up to 2000, uh, depending on the volume. Um, there's some info on oneflyingdutchman.com that uh, um, and you can make a down payment there too. Uh, I'm busy. I'm a one-man show. I built, I built all the stuff myself. And so the earliest you can get aboard is probably just before Christmas. Uh, um, um, but I don't work 60 hours a week anymore. I work 30 hours a week. So you have to wait. Um, and um, yeah, on my website, oneflyingdutchman.com good info uh get on the list you don't have to make up your mind on what you want but if you're never on the list without that down payment um all, all we can do is talk but you're you're, in, you're never going to get a board um and you, you said about uh one board a week is what you build approximately yep. Yeah. yep i mean that, that price between one to two thousand dollars is about the same what you would pay for an imported board too if it's carbon construction and so on right it's i'm, not I'm really sometimes that much more expensive no, I'm sometimes cheaper. The, the, the drawback with me is patience, but uh, you get what you want. And I really enjoy the conversation with people and fine tuning that. Um, I can offer those prices because I don't have much overhead. Uh, and how, my, I, how much time do you give people? Like sometimes I feel like um, when you do custom orders, you spend so much time talking to the people that you would have to almost charge extra for that. Yeah, but. Uh, how much do you do you limit the amount of time you spend talking to people or is it just like you'll go on for hours if you need to no i'll go on because it, it all washes out some people know exactly what they want and some people will say it's up to you mark you've seen me foil make what you want um but i i do have i do feel obliged to to listen i mean half the success of a, of a, of a good equipment is for shaper and builder is listening and so um no i don't limit it um i do limit it when they didn't make the down payment and I, at some point i'm like are you gonna order a board or are you gonna order it from your neighbor and you want to milk me for information yeah. so uh, you know it's but uh 95 of my customers are respectful and they know that i've been around the block and so they're not gonna you're not trying to waste your time telling you oh, about their not. surf trip to mental wise or something like that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. No, all is, all is good in that yeah. aspect. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, and I do appreciate your time and thanks for not charging me for your time. <laughs> no, of course not. No. And everybody yeah. else that's listening, it's, it's all free, good stuff. Uh, tons yeah. of good information. Really appreciate it. And yep. yeah. And so if somebody wants to order, just go to, is it flyingdutchman.com is the website? Uh, the, word, the word one, uh, O-N-E, uh, oh, in front one, of it. Uh, flyingdutchman.com. Yeah. I'll put the link down below too in the description if, if anyone wants okay. to link to it. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, Mark. Appreciate your time. Okay. And have a great yes. rest of your day. Aloha. Okay, you too. Take care. Thanks for doing this, Robert. Yeah. Okay, Mark has one more thing he wants to talk about, wetsuits. Yeah, I think something um, um, the um, when your knees start, so some protection on your on your knees in terms of uh, pants. Um, I've seen people even here go to Walmart and get knee pads. Uh, maybe it looks a little dorky, and you can get rid of them after a couple of weeks, but uh, to protect your knees, and um, um, because it's obviously a wind sport. Um, I like smooth skin, uh, long sleeve wetsuits, two mil enough to keep the wind off your of your skin and it does offer a little bit of protection in case you get nicked or something um but it's easy to get cold i find and uh you'll fall in the water a thousand times so you're in the wind in the water in the wind in the water so it's easy to get cold and uh so investing in a good wetsuit tight fitting good thing yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and what you said too about, like, especially when you're beginning, you spend a lot of time on your knees and then sometimes you're like kneeling on the board and you kind of tip off and your knees just kind of slide over the deck pad material and yes. that just like rips up your shins and your knees. So, and, yes. and another thing that I've seen people sometimes have foot straps with exposed screw heads and then sometimes the screw heads get like little sharp edges on them and that's yeah. you have to be super careful with that like that'll just tear up your shins if you slide off of it off of your board yes yeah and the beginning i don't think any beginner is is should have foot straps 
it's it's yeah for day no two. footsteps for beginners for day two um yeah um, well, or, or yeah. later i mean yeah, if, learn if at all. <laughs> yes yes so do you re recommend that people learn to switch stance right away or do you think that's kind of optional or like there seems to be two yeah it, it, it would be good to switch stand right away it's easier on the body and um i don't know how you're gonna learn to get on foil toe side in the beginning it's just too hard i mean you obviously in the beginning gonna struggle on on one side your non-favorite side but uh learning how to if you're say regular foot which is left foot forward i, I think left foot forward yeah and uh so you're gonna and the way the trade winds here at least are you have to get off the coast uh, uh goofy foot so it, it is a little awkward but um uh, i think you're ultimately going to pay more of a price by not learning it uh, again you can go upwind better too if you're if you're um uh if you're naturally footed on the board your switching. angle is better that's my take what's it any tips on switching your stance while you're up on the foil uh beforehand is most likely better in the beginning and uh, i do it before i i'm going to attack or jive um but there's no right or wrong you can do it uh, halfway through or i've seen the the, the smooth operators do it do it during um or some people do it after um uh, or some people do uh one side before and the other tack or jibe they do it after no right or wrong yeah i mean i'm i can't even do it yet so I do, that's why i always try to get tips for that <laughs> i, uh, I always yes. just ride with my feet in the same position but like uh, i was interviewing gunner last week and he said like he does a little pump, so the, and then while the, while the foil is coming up, he puts his back foot to the front and then moves the back foot, the front foot to the back. So while the foil is kind of coming up, he puts his weight forward and then. Yeah. So yeah, so, I, I so agree with that. And your, your your rear foot always has to come forward first. You can't put your forward foot rear. It's your rear foot moving forward. And I do a bit of a shovel, and I sometimes do a little bit of a touchdown. So I have uh, uh, a little bit of, uh, I don't know, uh, it helps out a little bit uh, on, the, on a small tap down. It's, mm -hmm. it's a tap down and then I bounce back up. And then in that moment of touching down, I have my feet switched. Okay. Yep. All right, good. Anything cool. else? Any, any other magic tips you have? <laughs> uh, Just to say. M magic tips no oh, yeah you mentioned you mentioned about, earlier on okay. yep go well, i was gonna say what about injuries have you had any injuries and do you, do you do any like exercises for wing foiling that prevent injury or any other tips like that i know as you get older it's always more likely that you hurt yourself or have well, you had any issues all, with the shoulders or wrists or any elbows anything like that uh yeah but i personally get better looking every morning so i don't i'm not dealing with okay. that I'm like me <laughs> <laughs> but no i'm just kidding man um I, I do think we got to be careful for our wrists and our finger joints because it's tough uh I, I use my fingers already shaping boards i'm still holding a planer uh so um but it is hard on my wrists uh, moving that wing especially when you're riding um in the downwind conditions is like it's hard um holding that wing all the time um that's why maybe a boom is a little bit easier on the joints um who knows um all kind of all remains to be seen um i do think riding toe side of, uh switch foot is a little bit easier on the on the back but uh any tips any tips no the wetsuit is a good one um uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the normal thing is just sunscreen, man. Even if you think you're cold, uh, you're, it's brutal, the, the UV. And uh, so I wear a hat now. Um, I've, and the wetsuit is really helping out. You barely need any sunscreen, hat, and a wetsuit. And 
you only got your nose and ears a little bit. Um, oh, I have no. a question for you that's kind of yeah. unrelated, but you said you're a coffee fanatic like I am too, but like, how do you prepare your coffee? Do you use a French press or espresso or what, how do you make your coffee in the morning? Uh, espresso machine. I got a nice espresso machine and I, uh, I buy a medium dark roast and um, yep. Do you yeah. just drink it black or do you put, what do you put in your coffee? Now I used to, but I, I moved to the dark side and I bought cream now. So I'm not, um, no more straight rocket fuel. I, I, uh, I drink cappuccinos, I'm afraid to say. Yeah. <laughs> Gone soft. Uh, I mean, the, yeah, whipping cream just makes it so much better, I think. <laughs> yes. yes. And I, I'm, I come with where I, I can, I eat pretty fat fatty foods so i eat avocados drink beer mayonnaise massive amounts stay skinny so i have that luxury so mm. it doesn't matter um if i drink fat and yeah yeah but i mean i think actually drinking fat in the morning is is a good way to um fuel yourself you know because it gives you like sustains like sustainable energy it seems like yes less spike fat, fat um up yes and it's good for your brain too it's like brain food but um yeah what about nutrition like do you have any special things you do in terms of nutrition or do you just eat whatever and stay stay, stay skinny and healthy um well i do stay skinny but my wife cooks really good and we we buy organic food um uh, um but uh no i don't pay i used to pay more attention i i I really like uh, the the product line of of hammer gel, uh, but I'll be honest, I I, I haven't done it um, in the days when you and I used to do the the crossings. I don't think you can do those type of of uh, exercises without uh, scientific uh, help from a really reputable brand because you just boink. But with mm -hmm. wing forning, you expend less energy. Uh, I'm not exhausted anymore at the end of a session but it, it would help me the next day if i drink some recover right um i'm not disciplined enough um but it would be wiser for me to do that instead i drive to the store and buy beer <laughs> but i shouldn't but uh you know uh, i don't know i'm not and I'm, I'm not a serious athlete anymore i'm a serious fun machine now uh yeah different focus so so from the food that you could get in, that you can get in Holland, like the you know good bread, good cheese, good beer, and things like that. What what do you miss the most on Maui? Like what what can't you get on Maui that you would eat in in Holland when you're home? Well, I used to be a bit of a beer snob and thinking, oh, the European wines, the Belgian beers, sorry, the European beers are so much better. But there's so many good American beers now, and even the cheese is good and. I'm sorry to say, even, I mean, Costco makes a really nice whole grain bread. And um, do what, do I mean, what do I miss about Holland? There is some really sharp aged cheeses that are like, yeah, awesome over there. And um, mayonnaise is good. And uh, there's some typical uh, winter foods that we I used to enjoy when uh, when you go ice skating, when, when the winters were still cold, uh, split pea soup is good um mm. there's there's mashed potatoes that are really good the, the holland is a potato country uh um what else do i miss now nah, more than anything the ambiance and the fact that it's a little bit cozier in in restaurants or outside patios in in places you can sit outside have your coffee or your beer and Hawaii is not a, a cozy place to to uh, to sit down in a restaurant. There is some good places, but you can't sit outside here, except if it's Mama's Fish House. But then you need uh, some type of wicked Amex uh, credit card to pay for it all. Uh, so yeah, nah, uh, I don't miss much about Holland except my family. Do you, do you have kids or no, no, children? Oh, no kids, uh, dog, cats, chickens. Um, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah. When's the last time you traveled, um, outside of Hawaii? Uh, 
it's been a year and a half since I got back uh, from Europe. Uh, yeah, January, and I think we're discussing the severity of uh, of COVID right around that time. So it's what is that now? Uh, almost a year and a half. Uh, yeah, and I am going in October, November um, back home. My my dad's getting old. And I want to see mm -hmm. him and. Yep. Do, you do, do you miss traveling or like for me, I, 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 in a way I really miss it, but it's also nice not to have that disruption in your life all the time. Right. Yeah. Like, cause in a way like that, the jet lag and all that kind of stuff, it kind of disrupts your life pretty in a yes. pretty major way. Right. It does uh, easy on the budget and on all that. What I do miss is uh, I find Hawaii an awesome place to live, but in terms of inspiration for me in the composite world, or even entrepreneurial, it's um, it stifles me here a little bit. It, I, I'm deadened by uh, by the amount of no's that I get if I want to start something new, or if I if I need uh, different materials, uh, the tra either transportation or just uh, I, I lack that when I'm in uh, where I'm from in in that part of of um, Holland in The Hague. There's a couple universities with some smart people trying new things. Innovations are really um, um, in the foreground there, and um, and that part of the industry is really, you know, um, promoted. Um, and the same I have when uh, my wife's from New York, and we go to the city, and I I love the entrepreneurial spirit there, and crazy fashion and uh, not that I'm a fashion freak because I always walk with the same t-shirt and the same pair of shorts, but uh, I do like seeing it and, and being influenced, but I miss that part. Um, but I'll get it back in a year or so or half a year. It's, it's not like I, I wake up daily going, oh man, I got to go. Or like you said, man, I, I hate the, the preparation for travel and, um, and the time in the plane. I'm grumpy. Uh, because I can't afford or I choose not to spend money on first class ticket because I'm too mm. cheap. Uh, but I should uh, because putting me in a, in a small seat for six hours is like, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. It takes yeah. 19 hours to get to, to that part of Holland. Yeah. And same with you in Berlin. It's not easy to get to. So, yeah. And then the time difference is 12 hours. So it takes you almost two weeks to, fully adjust to those that time difference and then it's time to go back already right <laughs> yes yes yeah 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 and and i kind of found too like during the pandemic for myself personally that um i started going like on hikes that i've never been on before and just like really traveling a lot of it is just seeing new things and going kind of on a, on an adventure right so but you can like there's so many places that i haven't been to yet like you know, like, for example, hikes that I've never been to with views that I've never seen before here, right here on my island and close, close to my house, you know. So a yes. lot of it is like, you, were, you know, you can have that same feeling of adventure, I think, closer to home. Yes. I agree. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Thanks for sharing some more thoughts. It's funny how um, it seems like kind of trivial stuff, but uh, I, you know, obviously we both enjoy talking about it and I think people enjoy listening to it too. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and for us, we think it's, it's all comes, uh, uh, um, easy for us, but too, but we learned it the hard way. And, and, um, yeah, like I said, with the wetsuits and, uh, and just being comfortable and baby steps, um, it's a pretty difficult sport. Um, I find in general, um, well, it's so, all, also like sometimes I tell people it's like you're learning two things. You're learning the you know how to handle the foil and the board, and you're yeah. learning how to handle the wing. So try to learn like one one thing at a time. Like if you can learn how to foil first, maybe behind a boat or something like that, and if you can learn how to handle it with the wing on on the beach as much as you can, or just on a, on a stand up paddle board, like you said, and then just yep. kind of yeah, try to learn them separately and then put them together but yeah uh, glenel was saying just kind of enjoy the learning you know the, like 
enjoy that pain that you're going through. <laughs> yes. It's yes. kind of part of the fun, I guess. So, yeah. I agree. But yeah, it's I not agree. as easy as it looks, but you can, I mean, I would say it's a pretty, like, it's definitely doable, you know? It's like, don't yes. give up too easily. Don't give up no. too easily. No, most people that are trying it get hooked in. Uh, I haven't talked to many people said, ah, man, I give up. Uh, too, too difficult. Not for me. Um, yeah. I see a lot of used equipment on Craigslist, but it's probably just people that are moving oh, up to the next step. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. All right. Thanks, Robert. Robert. I hope you get a bunch of custom orders as a result of this. Uh, I'm sure oh, you will. Oh, no, then I have to go back to work. We don't want to do that. Yeah, you have to, you'll have to work more. Sorry. I'm going to send them your way. <laughs> yeah, send them to me. Do you have boards in stock? We have some wing boards. Yeah, we have the boards called the Wing Master. So th those are those are nice um, boards. Actually, those are the only foil boards we have right now. We're sold out of prone foil boards. We're sold out of stand-up foil boards. But we're getting more soon. So a lot okay. of stuff back in stock again. And we have those PPC wings that are great. I told you about those okay. earlier. So yes. Yeah. Okay. Right on, Mark. Yeah. All Aloha. right. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Okay, that's a wrap for another great episode. I think Mark Rappahorst was such a good guest, funny, entertaining, and a great story. Clearly someone who lives his life to the fullest, following his dream, and trying to find a good balance between working, the, doing the things he loves, and also having fun and living a good life, having a good relationship with his partner, and getting out there and and you know staying healthy and all that so that's always a balance that i'm trying sometimes struggle with you know having a business and loving what you do but sometimes being a workaholic and doing trying to do too much at once so sometimes finding that good balance is, is challenging in life so anyways i hope you enjoyed it i hope you got as much out of it as i did and hey if you liked it please click that thumbs up button down below and also subscribe to our channel if you're not already a subscriber. We're going to have a new video posting every single day for the month of June 2021. So join us for those videos. It's going to be kind of challenging to put out a new video every day, but I'm going to do my best and uh, appreciate your support. So thanks for watching. See you on the water. Aloha.